for the recording, you want me to stand here? See how this goes? All right. Well, good evening, everyone. As Steve mentioned, my name is John Buchanan. I work for AssetMark, which is a large financial investment platform. I've been with the firm just over 20 years. Um, my job within our investment group is a lot of the communication, portfolio construction, um, basically translating a lot of our work into less gibberish from a, uh, a very quantitative aspect into something that's far more street level and, and easier to digest. Um, to the, the point he was just making around how we've managed portfolios without going into the boring and the, the nitty gritty, the, the real kind of high level is, and this kind of gives you a backdrop to my comments on the economy, any questions you have about interest rates and inflation and whatever else, national debt, state debt, et cetera, we're very fundamental in our work. Fundamental just simply means we want to see real math. We want to see real cash flow, real companies, real products, real services. We don't invest in hope. We don't invest in um, fly-by-night operations or something that is a get-rich-quick scheme. We leave that for others to tinker and uh, hope for. But we are far more like a Warren Buffett, Peter Lynch approach. We are looking for just really great quality businesses. And I use that word in purpose, uh, business, not a stock. Stock is almost, in some cases, like a pejorative, right? But business is an actual enterprise. It's something that is functioning and creating cash flow. So uh, Steve gave me some topics tonight to talk about. I always have a few that seem like they're coffee table items. Inflation is always front and center in this era. And then that ties into interest rates, which seems to be top of a lot of conversation. And then probably a topic like national debt, the growing debt. We were just talking about that a few moments ago. But what kind of questions do you have? I, I can ramble, I can bore, but I'm curious if you have anything top of mind as well. Nothing at all. Wow. Oh, there we go. Got a taker. I'm like an auctioneer up here. Yeah, you just get rid of the Fed. That's one way, but no, that's a joke. Uh, um, I'm looking at where we are in the, in the, the broad, if there are broad global changes in the economy, it's, it's a position of where everything that we're doing is in our lives. And so your thoughts on that, uh, that edge to edge between the two. Is that question targeting like the growth of India, China, Southeast Asia, or is that something different? And the impact of the, the, the policies and yeah. the Yeah. And what does that mean in terms of our lives and our budget for children and grandchildren as, as well as the growth of our currency and not? Yeah, that's a good one. And that was actually one of your questions, too, was um, impact AI. I think it was more in the facet of investments, perhaps, how you were asking it? Both, but yes. Okay. Anything else? I got a wizard through about the technology and what it means and so forth. And I've got 20 minutes. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> any. Cover it well, whatever you do. Yeah, we'll try. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, comments? All right, well, I'll start with interest rates, then we'll get into the Fed. Well, the Fed is like spot and center with uh, the interest rates, inflation, and then we can move into AI and just in general technology versus manual labor, we'll call it, and skilled labor and so forth. Uh, so you probably saw in the news, CPI printed out. It was all over the mainstream media just a day ago that CPI had come down a little bit, just a tiny amount. Uh, the key takeaway, though, is when they say that inflation is slowing down or they'll use the word cooling, a lot of people actually interpret that as prices are coming down. But actually what it means is that prices just aren't going up as fast as they were the prior quarter in the prior year. When you look back over the last several years, the cumulative growth of inflation in the United States now is about 30%. And you all know that. You go in the grocery store, you go in your local Home Depot or Lowe's, everything is noticeably more expensive. When you look at your car insurance, that's up 20%. You look at homeowner's insurance, that is also up 20%. So all of that's been driven by inflationary kicks to your question, spot on to your question, lots of printing of money. We were talking about it earlier. 
If you look at where we are right now, national debt, $35 trillion. If you go back just four years ago, it was about $23 trillion. So in the span of four years, we've grown the debt by 50%. But if you go back to 2015, the national debt was at $18 trillion. So in the span of 10 years, we've actually doubled the debt. But better context is, from the start of our republic in the 1700s, it took over 200 plus years to get us up to $18 trillion in debt. And then in the span of just 10, we replicated it all over again. So that's the printing of the money, which leads to inflation. And you can look across the globe for plenty of examples of how that works, Argentina, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, and on likes the others, right? Where you have all this inflationary kick. So now the hope is that the printing will slow down, but it hasn't yet. I mean, we're running this year alone a $2 trillion budget deficit, meaning the government's spending $2 trillion beyond what they're actually bringing in through tax revenue. Now the nemesis here for the Fed is they actually need to get the rates down because the national debt continues to grow at such parabolic rates that the borrowing cost for the US government is now in excess of a trillion dollars per year. It actually exceeds that of defense. Defense is now in pole position number four for government expenditures, Social Security, Medicare, now it's interest on the debt, followed by the Department of Defense. It used to be the other way around. So the Fed has this unenviable position that they actually have to figure out how to cool the inflation rates down to something tolerable, 2% is the target, where at 35 is the published. But at the same time, they've, they're staring at this massive debt load that's growing by monster numbers, and the borrowing costs associated with that is expanding rapidly. And they need to get these 5% Fed funds rate, 5% Treasury market rates down to probably around 35 or 3% and just try to put a lid on the growth not only of the printing of the money but also in the cost of the carrying itself. So will they achieve it? Um, what we're seeing right now is a slight uptick in unemployment numbers. That just came out the other day. So we're about 4.1% moving higher, and most people would find the happy balance at around 5% unemployment. If we can get to that number, what that will do is slack off some of the demand that's in the economy for goods. If you have less demand, prices may start to actually really truly cool down. Sales will start back, and some of the more jacked up prices that we've experienced might actually start to settle a little bit. So that'd be favorable. That might in fact get them to the magical 2% inflation rate that they're trying to achieve without busting the economy. Busting the economy meaning if they keep rates high, if you start to have defaults, if you start to have employment, unemployment accelerating higher, you could actually go into a recession. It's like walking a, a tightrope, one misstep and you're off the rope. And that's the, the fine dance and fine walk that they have to do right now. All right, that's a lot of gibberish. Any questions, comments? Interesting, boring, interesting, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Little, little for us, little for the Ukrainian conflict, more for the Europeans because of their cost now of energy input because they cut off the Russian supply. So they now get the Russian supply through India. It works brilliantly. Um, that's sarcasm, by the way. <laughs> a little bit, not much. I mean, we're not, so if you're Egypt, it has because Egypt sourced a lot of their grains from Ukraine. But if you're the United States, Ukraine's not making stuff for us. So that doesn't really disrupt us. But it is disruptive to the Europeans because their cheap source of energy coming from Russia is now gone, or at least gone directly. They're still getting Russian fuel. They just threw it through, they go through India to get to it. Um, I have a bunch of European friends and I always say, you know what the Europeans need is more sanctions on themselves because the sanctions haven't worked. Russia is now the fourth fastest growing economy in the world and Europe is going into recession at the same time. 
and a lot of it's because their energy costs have exploded as a result of where they're now having to you know, source their fuels. But your pandemic question is a correct one in that, or the, the, the direction in which you're asking is correct. We had supply chain disruption at the exact time that we had massive stimulus. So we were injecting money directly in the pocket of the consumer at the same time that goods were not available. So if, if you've ever taken Economics 101, that was a massive imbalance. It's people were flush with cash and nothing to buy. So what was available to buy just exploded in price. And so that's the disequilibrium, disequilibrium we experience. But we're mostly out of that now. I mean, there are still some supply chain disruption, but for the most part, it's kind of gone. Fortunately, what is not gone is all this liquidity and how to sop up all that liquidity that's been put in the system. And that takes a lot of time. And the residual impact of that liquidity is not something that goes away in a year or two years from now. So that's going to be a nemesis for a little while longer, I think. Absent defaults in the, say, the bond market, some of the consumer credit, that would actually start to soak up some of that liquidity that's out there. In what facet? Clearance. Huh? What you said is the clearance of the vehicle. Actual cash in the system. So yeah. Savings accounts. It's savings accounts, but it's also just in spending. So when you look at like the employee retention credit that was given out by the government, that was um, I think it was twenty one thousand dollars per employee or twenty three thousand. Program's been around for a while. You know, that was contributing about $500 billion a year of liquidity directly from the federal government into the pockets of business owners per each of the employees that they had. Um, you saw these reports from airlines, like United Airlines was reporting uh, the highest percentage of children ever flying first class to Europe is because people were just so flush with cash, they were just overspending on everything under the sun. So that's a liquidity feature. Um, and also just the consumer in general, too. We had low unemployment, which meant that everyone did have a job that wanted a job. And in many cases, uh, the employees actually had bargaining power because there were actually so many people who were not counted in the labor force because they had answered surveys saying, I'm not looking for a job. So they're actually not considered unemployed by United States calculation. But the people who said, yeah, I do want to work, they could easily, in some cases, get $20, $25 an hour for unskilled labor, which, which then be, creates this domino pattern across the landscape of employment because now the orderly at the hospital who is making $22 an hour goes, hey, wait a second, the guy at McDonald's is making 20 Do you know what I do for a living? Like, it ain't fun. I want 35 And then the guy who's doing handyman work and electrical work goes, wait a second, orderly? That's what I was making. No, wait, I, gotta, I need 55, right? And it just becomes this massive domino forward. Um, and that also provides liquidity in the system to a degree, right? So hopefully that answers the question. Then on the AI front, that's actually going to hook in well to the labor comment because labor costs in the United States have gone up dramatically. And that was a pandemic-driven situation with folks being out of the workforce and so forth. And a lot of them just getting paid to stay home, of course, as we know. That also puts pressure on the companies to get more profitable away from a human being doing the work. So when the margins are getting squeezed because inflation costs have gone up on the input for a company, could be a beverage company, could be a manufacturing company, as inflation ripples through their supply chain and they're having to buy product at a more expensive price point, tack on labor costs going up dramatically in some cases, insurance costs going up dramatically on those employees and on liability and so forth, margins can get squeezed out very tight. That's where AI comes in, where companies are looking to literally get rid of the people. And in some cases, you can do that. I mean, you're never going to see probably an AI replacement to an HVAC person coming in and installing an air conditioning system. But certainly, as we've all experienced in the restaurant industry, you go into a, a restaurant now, and you oftentimes are not ordering food from a human. But you're also being asked for a tip, which I always find interesting. <laughs> the machine wants a tip. I was having my hair cut the other day. I live in Washington, DC. And my barber 
gets a phone call. He answers it. And I'm thinking, he's cutting my hair. Why are you answering the phone? But he answered the phone. And I, he had the speaker turned on so loud. I could hear what he was saying, or I could hear what was said on the phone. And this person was speaking. And they said, yeah, I was looking to see if I'd come in this evening, like 6.30. And he's like, sure, 6.30. And it was this you know, one-minute conversation booking a call or booking an appointment over the phone. He, he sets the phone down. And he says to me, do you know what that was? And I was like, some guy booking an appointment? And he goes, that was Google's AI. And I was like, what are you talking about? He goes, yeah, that wasn't a human. That was AI. And I said, how does that work? I'm in this space, and I don't even know what the heck you're talking about. And he said, someone went on an app and just said, I want a 630 haircut. And then Google's system made the actual phone call, and the, the voice was able to interact and when you say, for example, no, I'm not, I don't have a 6.30 appointment available, I got a 7, it then turns around and books the 7 and then sends the message back to the actual user. But the user never had to pick up the phone. Pretty amazing, right? Yeah, Google Assistant. I mean, that's, and we're at the first versions of this. Yeah. 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 Yeah, if you look at aspects of the economy, I think that's the solid takeaway is when you think about CPAs, HR, potentially legal work, certainly something in patent, when you think about um, psychotherapy. Oh, that's an interesting one, yeah. How does that make you feel? Yeah. Your, your AI could ask that question? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but where I would focus is where is it not likely to replace is the skilled labor side, which is coincidental that we have such a substantial vacancy in the skilled labor in the United States. Uh, I follow Mike Rowe, if you're familiar with him. He's a, a guy who has been on the History Channel for years. He does the voiceovers for uh, Deadly's Catch. He did uh, Dirty Jobs with Mike Rowe. He has a whole foundation on skilled labor in the United States, how we completely abandoned the vocational trade in the pursuit of pushing everybody into college. And when you look at the numbers, we were seven to seven and a half million vacancies for skilled labor in the United States. And so where someone may lose a job, as they joke, a meat puppet job, right? Someone who was in a job that was easily replaced by AI, that person, if able, able-bodied, could transition or shift over to doing something that's more skilled. Because AI, maybe one day we'll figure out a way to take that out, but a person coming in your house and doing electrical wiring seems like a, a stretch, right? So that's the great news, is where AI probably will eliminate the redundancies, the just laborious, repetitive work. It's not there to replace the stuff that we actually have huge gaping vacancies in. If it was a world in which we had way too many electricians, way too many plumbers, and then you're saying, oh, we're going to have legions of people unemployed by this artificial intelligence, yes, that's a sad sort of prognosis. But in the situation that we have in reality, we have home for all these people who are about to become potentially unemployed. A lot of it's assumptions, I know, able-bodied, got to be interested in the work, that kind of stuff. But All right, any other questions? Well, for the impact of AI within portfolios, not a negative. Um, I'm sure if we thought long and hard about it, you might find something that could be negatively impacted. But it actually goes back to what I made a comment on. Efficiency of the business. Margins will get better. Uh, so from an investment standpoint, business operation, AI will actually improve a lot of these companies. Even companies that today don't see a complete fit for how AI may be able to benefit them, 
there'll be something on the peripheral that will be helpful to them and whether the cost of implementing that is worthy of what their return is going to be. But across the board, I would say that there's immense opportunity there for bettering the rate of return for the business itself. On for the interest rates coming down, that's beneficial for existing bondholders. It's not as beneficial for savers because as you're adding new money into a savings account now at a potentially lower yield, you know the math on that, that means you're making less. But from the stock market standpoint, it's always more beneficial, at least in the short term, simply because borrowing costs come down, liquidity tends to expand during that period of time, going back to your liquidity question. And most important perhaps in this era is when you look at the below investment grade companies, high yield, junk bonds, Michael Milken 1980s, that universe of the investment arena, they're under a lot of quiet pressure right now with where yields currently sit. Because in two, three years from now, a lot of those businesses might be in bad times. And ripple effects occur when even segments and pockets of the investment arena starts to malfunction. So if you had high delinquencies and high default rates occur in something like high yield or below investment grade companies, it does tend to have a marginal impact that can spread throughout the rest of the universe. So bringing down interest costs will help them. Refinance is what I'm getting at. I'm not kicking you off. I'm up here. <laughs> Uh, all the tech companies, of course. I mean, you could look at the NVIDIA's, Microsoft, Alphabet's, on down the list. Um, all of them, of course, are huge beneficiaries of it. Even in the manufacturing space, we're seeing beneficiary of AI. Um, any, any of the companies that we have that are service related as well. But no question, it's the tech first and foremost because they're receiving the cash flow of the people scrambling to buy the hardware and the software that goes to it. That's the front line. It's like, who made money in the gold rush? The gold miners? No, the guy sh selling the shovel, right? Well, NVIDIA is selling the shovels. And it's not necessarily the guy who's buying the, the shovel. It's, uh, it's the sellers of it. So any other questions before I wrap up? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, it's 265, but who's counting? It'll get to your number soon. Don't worry. There's less tax there. So where does this, like, how does this play out? Because it seems like it's just gone exponential. It has gone exponential. And I think what we have to get accustomed to is inflation at 2% may be a, a short period of, of uh, reprieve. Longer term, we probably are going to deal with higher levels of inflation because the government can't. We're, we're a democracy, right? Technically, we're a republic, but it's one and the same in our, our usage of it. We vote ourselves benefits. And we're never going to go to the polls and actually vote ourselves true cuts. And because of that, you can never really say there's a, there's a substantial forecast that we are ever going to rein this stuff in. And as a result, it means that by 2040, we could be at, say, 100 trillion. <coughs> in national debt. We certainly will be somewhere around 50 trillion by the end of this decade, which is only five and a half years away. So to say that that would double over the next 10 is very realistic. It just did double over the last 10. So um, what will that translate to? It could translate to the US dollar eventually weakening and other currencies starting to pick up momentum. And one of the things that I think is it, you want to pay very close attention to, going back to your question that involved Ukraine, is the U.S. has talked about confiscating the about 300 billion of Russian sovereign assets that are held predominantly in Europe. Saudi Arabia, it just broke in the news a week ago, had quietly threatened to actually purge their European bonds if the Europeans actually did that confiscation because there's no legal precedent for it. The dollar has always been viewed as the sanctuary currency, that we would never hurt you if you had assets parked in US dollars. If they go for it with that type of maneuver, it will rattle the cages of India and China and the petro world. 
and that would have the starting point of a slide potentially in the US dollars attractiveness, that would be very unfortunate because then that would actually accelerate and it already has kind of pushed that direction anyway, but it would accelerate the path that these other countries are looking at to get away from dollars. Not in full, but diversifying. Yeah, you had a question, sir? They count you if you answer the survey that you're unemployed, but your point is valid. If you answer that you're not looking for a job, yeah. you disappear. Yeah. So that's, that, I actually touched on that earlier. It's and like, we're all for that. It's oh yeah, sure. Taxes. Yeah. So yeah, uh, we stimulate prices coming down, but our taxes are going down. Yeah. So, I mean. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's, it, there's a lot of social economic issue to that beyond just coming out of our do out of our pockets to pay, it's the fact that as a society you're starting to creep negatively because you don't have product, your productivity is sliding. Right. And that, that goes back to my comment about AI, right? AI will flush out that redundancy. What you need to do is eventually make it harder for people to be unemployed right. if there are corresponding vacancies that are existing, and they are existing. Um, I mean, they exist even just in the fast food world. You could drive around and it's like, who was telling me earlier, was it you, that you went to, you had a friend that was staying at a hotel and the, there was nobody working the hotel? They literally, they just had left, right? I mean, that's an experience we've all seen. Like, there's just one person working a, a Panera Bread and you're like, how long is it gonna take to get my sandwich? Like, well, 20 minutes, right, so. No. A trade is going to be, I'm, I'm from the trade, so yeah. a trade is going to be your bread and butter, possibly. Oh, 100%. Versus a anthropology degree. 100%. No debt, and you're getting paid to, to be an apprentice. If you have grandkids or kids, I tell them, go to vocational school. I mean, that doesn't mean turn down college. It's just you're going to make a lot more money being in the vocational trades, potentially. I mean, unless you're in engineering or something, mathematician, something that's more specialized yeah yeah I mean that's true all right I know I'm way past my time so I will yeah Uh, that'd be a big shift because the educational system, the, the university system in the United States is more of an industry and less of a true educational structure anymore. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at the circle of life, you could make a joke that actually has a tremendous amount of validity. The United States government's the greatest loan shark on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. We're lending to our own children at rates in excess of what the United States itself borrows at we're putting no litmus tests on a child going into a university, getting, in often cases, absolutely worthless degrees, and they come out a product of debt and of an education that means nothing. So you have this, I won't pick on any degree. You have a made-up degree. It's not engineering, it's not mathematics, right? And your best hope is you become a barista at Starbucks with $200,000 in debt. And we are supporting that. That's crazy. And so, would the university change that and go to vocation? No. Add? No, I don't, it, because vocation can be done at the high school level, and then as, as he may be a test in the back, like, you could just go into an apprenticeship. You don't need to spend $100,000, $200,000 to achieve a, a skilled trade. You'll learn on the job. You'll get paid to learn. It's kind of a... Don't say that. I have got the degree. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Well, there's plenty of, but you know, 
there's lots of kids who are going to college who come out with no worthy degree. Your degree was probably worthy. There's a ton of kids who do not have worthy degrees, meaning they can't get jobs for what they got an education in. And that's a sad state. And now we're at one and a half trillion in national debt just from degrees. And it's like, I think you're cutting me off. You're like, get off the stage. Yep. The simple solution is this, you cut off funding. Seriously. It goes back to your question. It's liquidity. We have ample liquidity chasing these universities. It's become an industry. If the government actually cut off the funding and said, that's it, guess what happens to tuition prices? They would collapse. They would actually go down. The tuition prices have become so obscene because why? It's free money being printed by the government and handed to these kids and saying like, yeah, go get $400,000 in college debt and go get a degree in you know, um, space, space staring. I mean, and that the government doesn't put any litmus test on what they're giving loans for. If they did, if they said, oh, you want to become a doctorate engineering? Okay, you get 60,000, but everybody else gets 10 grand. When the liquidity dries up, the prices would come down. All right, I'm done. Thank you very much. I hope it was helpful.